Good morning to everybody. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on this Saturday morning. I'm sure everyone's quite tired either from following last night's budget or the US election throughout the week. So uh, looking forward to a, a, a bright eyed discussion this morning. Um, I've got a, a really interesting and varied panel this, today to discuss this sort of central issues in Malaysia's economy. So I'm really looking forward to this morning's discussion. Um, I'll just make some, a few kind of brief introductory comments. So every year we do this liberalism conference and every year we, we have a session on the economy to talk about the direction of economic policy in Malaysia, the direction of the economy. And of course, this year we're doing that the day after a, a economically and politically significant budget and in the context of a global pandemic that's thrown the economy out of kilter. So inevitably, I think much of today's discussion will focus on trying to interpret what was announced yesterday. What is the direction of Malaysia's um, economic policy and Malaysia's recovery under the pandemic? But I hope we can also touch on some broader themes like the longer term development of Malaysia's economy. I think even before we entered the pandemic, there were questions around the direction of Malaysia's economy whether we were doing enough to sort of entrench competitiveness and broad-based development to achieve high income status and, and to achieve the benefits broadly across the country. And I think then even beyond that, I think now that there's, there's real discussion among political liberals about how best to tackle some of society's ch challenges in the direction of economic policy, whether that's on combating the climate breakdown or whether it's dealing with wealth inequality. And so I think the discussion on economic policy has become much more diverse and varied in the last few years. So in that context, we have a lot of interesting issues to discuss, uh, whether we get into the very high level issues or we stay focused on the whether or not the wage subsidy is sufficient. Uh, I'm very happy that we're going to have a, a kind of interesting and varied discussion today. So um, just please throughout the discussion, uh, feel free to share um, your questions in the Q&A box. Um, uh, you feel free to direct that at specific panelists or just in general. I will try to cover as many of them as I can, um, but we're always short on time and we've got lots of material to cover. So apologies in advance if I can't answer every question. Um, so I think we have all our panelists ready to go. Uh, Dr. Juwita, can I just ask you to turn on your camera as well? Great, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce our panelists uh, each in turn, um, and they're gonna just provide some, some brief opening remarks on um, the issues that I've mentioned, which cover a broad range from the budget, the direction of Malaysia's economy in the context of the pandemic and more broadly, and sort of bigger, big, bigger picture questions about where economic policy is headed. So to save you all from a, a long spiel from me in terms of background, I'll just in, introduce each of our panelists in turn. Um, so I'm going to start with um, Dr. Carmelo, uh, Dr. Carmelo Felito, who is the CEO of the Centre for Market Education and a senior fellow at Ideas. Uh, Carmelo is also a research advisor for Provalinda Nusa in Jakarta, Indonesia, and a senior fellow at the Property Rights Alliance in Washington, D.C. Uh, Carmelo studied economics in Italy and, Malay and, is a, and has taught economics in Malaysia, uh, particularly in terms of microeconomic theory and policy and the history of economic thought. His economic research is devoted to further expanding free market economics as taught by the Austrian school, with particular reference to business cycle analysis, capital theory, and entrepreneurship. Carmelo is not just a scholar, he is for the past 10 years also developed a strong business background in Southeast Asia, enhancing the regional business for multinational companies producing equipment for the poultry industry. So I think Carmelo has both a, an academic uh, and theoretical economic perspective, as well as providing you know, concrete experience of running an SME in Malaysia you know, during this time. So over to you, Carmelo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Uh, OK, that's good. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. And thanks to Ideas for having invited me to this uh, panel. Um, before I share my presentation that was actually prepared before the budget was announced, of course, um, a quick uh, um, insight on the budget specifically. I think that uh, the, the thing that uh, uh, struck me more positively was the, the presence of a lot of targeted measures. 
So it seems that the, the government is moving toward targeted aid and there was no choice in this direction. We couldn't keep on uh, spending money uh, on the generality of the public. Uh, but what instead, uh, according to me, is uh, the most negative issue, the, most, uh, the biggest flaw is the lack of uh, a strategy for a recovery. So with this budget, we can see that we can spend a lot of money without achieving anything permanent. Um, so th th that is, I think, the, what is uh, missing under the, the perspective of the bigger picture. So uh, let me share the presentation that I prepared for today. Here we are. Okay. And I will start with, uh, with a slide that I, I present now in all the, the latest uh, uh, occasions that I had to speak in public, because I think it's very, it's very important and it's something that is being disregarded. Let's not forget when we discuss policies that each policies have consequences and these consequences can be intended, that means in line with the desired outcomes, but most of them are unintended. So good intentions are not enough to achieve good outcomes from policy perspective. Uh, we need to recognize the importance of complexity and complexity needs to drive us toward humbleness in policy making. Second point, the importance of trade-offs. Um, a certain policy can help achieving a certain target, but it is never free. We always have to look at what we are giving out in order to achieve something. The typical example, like you, high, you increase tax on the rich, but you discourage investment and you can uh, harm the poor by increasing unemployment. This is just a general introduction. Uh, talking about uh, the Malaysian economy, the path of the Malaysian economy, uh, I think that when we met last time, I, I discussed this uh, concept of the reverse square root uh, path. Uh, I was thinking it was only my idea, but I recently found that Fortune mentioned it already last July. And so we had a very strong uh, downturn because, of course, the economy was uh, completely shut down. Then we had the natural rebound when, uh, um, when the economy was uh, slowly reopened. But the risk that I think we have in front is that after uh, the rebound, we will have a very flat growth. So what was announced yesterday in the budget in terms of growth forecast, I believe is rather optimistic. Um, I think that that target can be achieved only if we can get rid of COVID tomorrow, and if we um, reopen the all international borders tomorrow, regaining confidence. But as I think we all agree that is not going to happen, um, to imagine the Malaysian economy to rebound by 7% next year, I think is pretty unrealistic. And therefore, all the uh, expectations on, uh, uh, on uh, government revenues are also affected by this unrealistic prediction. The, the economy is not doing well. The business mood is not, is not positive. Now, <clears throat> what, um, what is the economic crisis that we have in front of us? First of all, is not an economic crisis driven by economic contradictions like the one that, was, that happened in the West in 2007. Uh, where we had the typical business cycle uh, dynamic. Here we have uh, a crisis that was totally policy driven. The economy was basically shut down. Then we can discuss if this was for the good or for the bad. This is not important, but that policy drove the economy on an unprecedented uh, downturn. And uh, the issue is uh, regarding the, the topic of today. So if liberalism is somehow at risk, is that because of the difficulties created in the economy by the different MCOs, voices are raising from different parts for support, intervention, subsidies. Everybody feel harmed and everybody want help. The contradiction is that we ask help 
from the government, which is the same institution that created that problems. So um, uh, th this is uh, uh, this is the risk that we are we are facing now, and that can bring us to a bigger role uh, for the government in the economy, which I believe is is pretty dangerous. Yesterday was announced massive uh, use of GLCs for hiring more civil servants. Uh, so it was announced a program of uh, new hiring in the public sector. Um, my point is uh, that can help obviously the economy, something like that, but if there was no ratio, no reason to hire uh, those people one week ago, why we have the reason to hire that people now? Okay, we want to help the people, but what happened when you overemploy people in the medium and long run? Are we going to have more Malaysian Airlines situation? So political hiring is a political appealing, usually welcomed by the people, but very dangerous for the economy in the medium and long run. Um, one element that could uh, turn in our favor in stopping big government is that the government heavily intervened at the very beginning of the pandemic, allocating something like 22% of the GDP, a massive intervention. And now it is very clear that that intervention was too much and too soon. We locked down the economy when we had 100 cases per day. That, that was a ridiculous number compared to what was happening in Europe at that time. And now that we have almost 2,000 cases per day, um, we have basically exhausted our resources. We don't have an adequate social safety, uh, safety net, but at least we realize that now a general lockdown, like, like the one that was done a um, few months ago, is basically uh, unaffordable. And resources for further help are hard to be found also because with uh, many firms in uh, in difficulties there will be obviously less uh, um, there will be less uh, tax revenues for the government um, positive side of this analysis is just the, just shortly and we should not be discouraged by the the size of the pandemic in malaysia because mortality in this country remains extremely low just quickly two graphs as you can see the blue line show us um, the total deaths or over the total cases in percentage terms so even if cases increase in a very uh, important way in the last month uh, mortality remains extremely extremely uh, low and this is a positive news you can see you can see this also in this graph there is not a proportional increase on that. This is this means that our health system is is reacting uh, pretty well. Now, despite the lack of resources, the government is trying to increase its intervention in the economy with policies that will surely backfire. And I have in mind, in particular, labor policies. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, the ban on foreign workers, and the most recent one is uh, the new procedures on hiring expatriates. The ban on foreign workers um, obviously is putting under stress those uh, uh, companies that do manufacturing or logistics operation in here. Uh, it is not enough, enough to ban foreign workers in order to get the locals to take over certain jobs that kind of capital reshaping will take time and will uh, happen only if uh, the economic downturn further, uh, uh, further deepen. Okay, so, uh, and we have seen, uh, and I already observed companies that decided to close down here in Malaysia because they cannot have workers in the manufacturing. Uh, this means that if this company closed down, not only the foreign workers are kicked out of the country, but also those locals that were employed uh, will lose the job. Same goes, <coughs> sorry, same goes with the expatriates. The government is trying to replace expatriates with, uh, with uh, locals, 
also for those expatriates that have their visa under renewal. This obviously will create a negative incentive to multinational company to remain in the country and eventually will bring them in other countries that are more competitive under this perspective. And rather than creating more employment for the locals, we, create, we will create more unemployment. All this is in total contradiction with what was announced yesterday in the budget in terms of reskilling. Unfortunately, with the, the, the policies that are in place, the only thing that we need is the skilling rather than reskilling. By the skilling, I mean that we need to convince people that wear white collars to become blue collars or to go to work in the plantations. Uh, if these uh, uh, new regulations on the labor market remain in place. So we can try to do whatever we want in order to reskill these people, but under the present circumstances, there are no job opportunities for those workers. So the only alternative that they will have in the medium run will be either to drive a grab or to go to, to, to do the so-called 3D jobs. So I think that we are placing too much emphasis on reskilling at the light of the fact that we are not creating that the conditions for that reskilling to be uh, potentially used somewhere. So the Malaysia first rhetorically rhetoric is politically appealing, but economically very dangerous. As I mentioned, we are risking for FDIs and multinational companies to move elsewhere. Malaysia is not playing very smartly in the regional competition, and this will not be good for Malaysia. And this uh, linked me back with the first slide, the importance of unintended consequences. So if your intention is good, you want to increase employment, but you do that with measures that potentially are creating more unemployment rather than employment, then your policy is backfiring you. So the analysis of an intended consequences is something that is uh, often lacking in the policy making and we need to rediscover. To conclude, uh, we need a totally different, uh, different pace uh, for, uh, the, for the Malaysian policy making. First of all, I keep on saying we need to move from containment measures to, um, uh, to recovery policies. And I don't have in mind necessarily spending more money. We can do recovery without spending money. First of all, avoiding extensive MCOs like the one that is involving Selangor now. So doing more targeted actions. Then the best way to create job opportunities is to be more open rather than more close. So do whatever it takes to attract MNCs and FDIs that are leaving China, and also the one that very soon will leave Singapore, because Singapore is becoming even more strict on labor regulations. So there are opportunities to be taken, but we have to play in competition from the good perspective. We have to try to attract these opportunities, not to be even stricter than Singapore. We cannot afford uh, that. Um, other ways are, in example, liberalization, reforming, uh, reforming GLCs. These are all measures that don't cost a penny, uh, but can create opportunities. And uh, another measure that I keep on stressing is the importance for Malaysia to become an important player in ASEAN in a discussion for a gradual reopening of international borders. We will never have a recovery if we don't allow business travels to start rehappening. People cannot do business on Zoom. You cannot buy a warehouse, invest in warehouse or invest in a manufacturing company or hiring people if we cannot see that people and that facilities. That is not going to happen on Zoom. So we need to start discussing this if we want to avoid flat growth for the next five years. So in a nutshell, we need more market, more freedom in order uh, to restore uh, a recovery path to go on a recovery path and escape the square root trap, the reverse square root trap. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Carmelo. Um, I think you've set up a lot of issues for us to get into, including the growth path, 
the role of GLCs, uh, the labor market position, I think is a whole discussion that we can have. And also the sort of level of openness um, on FDI and investment and the sort of relative discussions on that. So, okay, I'm gonna move uh, directly on uh, to Dr. Juwita. Uh, so Dr. Juwita Mohammed is a fellow in the economics, trade and regional integration division of ISIS Malaysia. Uh, previously, she worked at the Asia desk in the OECD in Paris. Uh, and at the Asian Development Bank Institute and Waseda University in Tokyo. Uh, she holds a PhD in international studies from, from Waseda University, where her research focused on the impact of trade liberalization on wage inequality between skilled and unskilled workers in Malaysia. So I think that is a very interesting uh, topic that plays directly into what uh, some of the issues that Carmelo was just telling up. Um, her research interests include trade, regional integration, protectionism, wage inequality, and the informal sector. So a lot of these issues which are being uh, hotly debated at the moment. So, Juwita, please, over to you for your uh, opening remarks. Thank you so much, Lawrence, and thank you um, to Ideas for um, the invitation. I'm excited to be here to be talking about the biggest budget ever proposed in Malaysia's history, but let's go into um, the details of uh, this um, budget. So I will be touching on three areas, namely Tibet, uh, digitalization, and also the SDGs. So we see that for the Tibet allocation, there is a significant share being funneled um, to the sector, six billion ringgit, especially to the institutions um, and the institutes um, who will create and execute TVET programs here in Malaysia. But I feel that the fundamental issue um, when it comes to TVET in Malaysia is actually the quality of the programs itself, which is very much linked to the mindset uh, of the people, um, of um, graduates and also employers and also parents, um, which actually lead, um, which can actually lead to higher enrollment. Um, and again, this has not been discussed in the budget. So again, efforts to streamlining and also monitoring of these programs were not highlighted in the budget, but what is needed, as we all know, is the efforts to restructure and reorganize the syllabus for TVET is very, very important so that we, we see that, so that we can see graduates being more competitive, not just domestically, but also internationally. So again, these are fundamental issues that were not highlighted. So I feel that while it's good to be allocating more, um, uh, allo um, more um, um, allocation uh, for such programs, but we have to understand that even with more programs created, when the mindset of the people are still unchanged, especially um, the employers, um, namely they're quite still quite negative towards uh, TVET graduates and its quality, graduates uh, of TVET in Malaysia are likely to um, uh, they need to um, compete more with local and also non-local graduates. So the bottom line is, um, along with allocation, the syllabus and also the quality of the TVET programs need to be upgraded so that graduates are competitive locally and internationally. For now, 17 different ministries are in charge of these TVET programs. And the more, um, uh, the more, um, uh, groups that are in charge of this and the more so that so then the more operation costs um, will inc they will incur. So let me go to digitalization and automation. So there is an undeniable focus by the government to help sectors in Malaysia to digitalize and automate. So we see that during the pandemic, digitalization um, efforts or people going, businesses going um, digitally um, have been uh, reaping benefits from such an effort. So here we see in the budget that um, the efforts are seen to cover the MSMEs with 115 million in grants. Um, the agricultural sector alone um, have the allocation, has the allocation of 100 million for high impact and high value um, agriculture and livestock. And also for the fishery sectors, 150 million were allocated for modernization of fishermen vessels in upgrading their technology to increase their productivity. So again, with these efforts, I feel that this is very much welcome, but 
in the meantime, we have to ensure that smaller, small farmers and also small fishermen will also benefit from such a move. I foresee that owners of um, assets will benefit, like the Taukis uh, who own fishing vessels, as well as big farmers um, who own um, such assets uh, will benefit, but not so much for the daily fishermen and farmers who do, who do not necessarily have the capital to acquire such asset or technology. Um, I feel that they will lose out without proper upskilling um, and um, this will again um, lead to the unintended consequence of income inequality between capital owners and also non-capital owners. So let me jump to the last point um, that I would like to make is on the SDGs. I am so, so happy that the government has allocated 5 million um, ringgit to the all party parliament group Malaysia on sustainable development goals. Um, this uh, project uh, on the SDGs will now be um, incorporated in the RMK 12. So for five years, there will be allocation on um, on the sustainable development goal projects. So what is different about this project is that um, uh, the government has allocated a huge sum to localize SDG efforts um, at the community level. So again, um, the 5 million ringgit um, is going to be funneled to different constituencies in Malaysia uh, to tackle issues concerning unemployment, decent jobs, income inequality, access to education and the like to the community level. So ISIS has been active in co-organizing the pilot project before this year with 10 different constituencies. Um, so this has been very, uh, this has also been very um, encouraging um, because of the help and also the cooperation given by different MPs and also the community on the ground. For example, in Jelly, where I'm the lead coordinator, we see that the communities are empowered. They get to identify and they will get to prioritize what kind of issues that they are facing um, on a daily basis. And they will also come up with their own solutions. And again, here, um, the allocation would be funneled to the community through NGOs and also local government agencies. So for the ones in Jelly, we found that um, for, the Orang As for the Orang Asli, um, group, uh, their livelihoods were uh, affected um, by the pandemic and even before the pandemic. So small and micro projects are um, allocated uh, or are created as we speak um, so that um, uh, employment can be created. So again, this is something very interesting um, in empowering um, local communities to create their own uh, job opportunities. So that is all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Juita. And really interesting to hear about those specific examples. Um, sustainability is something I really want to come back to in the discussion because I guess maybe I was hoping for a bit more in the budget. Uh, so maybe we can discuss that. Um, so I'm very happy next to call on Jalil Rashid, um, who I'm sure many of you know. Uh, Abdul Jal Jalil Rashid is the former group CEO of PMB. Uh, Jalil started his professional career in fund management at Aberdeen Standard Investments and rose to become CEO of the, of the Sharia business at only 27 years old. Then he relocated to Singapore in 2013 to join Invesco as CEO South Asia at the age of 30. In 2019, he re relocated back to Malaysia to take on the lead as the youngest president and group CEO of Pabandanan National Bahad, uh, Malaysia's largest fund manager with the over US dollar 80 billion of assets under management. During his tenure, Jalil was also the chairman of Sapura Energy Bahad, Prolintas Group and Battersea Development Limited. Jalil is currently on a career break where he is mentoring young professionals, giving talks, improving on his tennis, and writing about his career experience and acting as a senior advisor for an international management consulting firm. Uh, I should also add uh, being a prolific commentator on Twitter and we definitely enjoy uh, combing through his comments. Uh, there's lots of discussion on our ideas WhatsApp threads on, J on Jadil's tweets. So it's, it's great to have the opportunity to, to speak to you this morning. So over to you Jadil for your opening comments. Yeah, th thank you, Lawrence. Um, 
you know, lo looking at the budget yesterday, I think at a glance, um, there were there were a lot of initiatives that were announced, especially for the lower income. Um, but what I felt uh, looking at it and where we are as a country in the midst of this pandemic is that it lacked a, a general direction about how the country um, would look like um, over the next three to five years. Um, you know, one uh, one thing that struck my mind was um, to to echo to Dr. Carmelo's point was that the revenue projection was rather optimistic in my view. You know, this is just simplistically looking at uh, how businesses have suffered um, over the last six months and will continue doing so. There'll be more unemployment um, and uh, with, with tax rates being cut and incentives being given. Uh, I just struggle to see really where that revenue uh, projection uh, is coming from. Uh, secondly, is uh, I'm a firm believer that in order for the economy to recover, we must contain the pandemic first, right? You know, what, how much money we throw at the economy, it's going to be pointless if we don't contain the pandemic, right? Because uh, we will then keep on coming back to this um, issue of having um, lockdowns, uh, which pushes back the economic recovery much longer. As you feel that you're going on this nice trajectory, you lock the country down um, and then it, it holds you back. You know, your economic recovery part becomes longer and longer. Um, so one, one thing that uh, I think needs to be uh, noted for the, for the government is that um, they must operate under the assumption that this uh, uh, vaccine will take years before it, it finally hits our country, right? Um, it, you, you know, it might be developed and might be ready um, in the next six months, but, you know, we've got 7 billion people in this world, everyone wants it, um, you know, there's a question of the cost, the distribution, you know, the realistically, um, so we, we must operate um, and prepare reactively early on, um, on how we can open the economy, um, reopen the economy um, within the constraints of this pandemic hanging um, above us. Right? Um, the, 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 um, the, to, to add on to the point about the comprehensive plan, uh, why I think it's important is um, we are a very um, external dependent um, country. Uh, we need to reopen our borders uh, somewhat. Um, you know, tourism is, uh, is a huge factor of our um, economy. And, uh, and that is suffering as well. And tourism uh, today is still the biggest multiplier industry for Malaysia. Um, you know, from the moment somebody lands right up to the time they leave, um, that it, it, it uh, benefits a whole range of industries. And that is what has been completely uh, wiped away right now uh, with, with, this, with this pandemic. So um, at, at first glance, when I look at the budget, I would have loved for the government to put more attention towards that to say, this is our plan. This is how we're gonna contain the pandemic. This is what we're gonna do shorter term. This is what we're gonna do longer term. Um, and uh, we need to go back to some semblance of our previous life with some, um, with, with some guardrails in, uh, in between. Uh, and this is how it's gonna look like. And that is what I struggle. Um, I've not seen um, yet in the, in the, in the uh, budget. The other one was also uh, that was that for me as I was looking through was uh, absence of uh, a real plan to digitalize um, a lot of things. I mean, as a country, and this is the trap all emerging market countries go into is talking about industrial revolution 4.0. You know, it's, it's a buzzword that's used a lot. Uh, but if there is a time for countries to start thinking about digitalization or ramping it up, it's really now. Um, the other issue I have with lockdown besides the economic impact is also the social impact. Um, you know, all of us in this room, we're, we're fairly lucky we can be in front of a screen um, doing our work and still getting paid. Um, but then there are people who have uh, daily wages um, who don't get paid. Then there are students as well um, who are struggling with online learning simply because not everybody in this country is blessed to have a, a, a laptop for every child. Um, so uh, that that is what that was also lacking. I know there was a, there was an idea to give out laptops, but you know it's also the digital infrastructure of the schools 
uh, is the cap capability of the schools uh, to be able to handle lessons online and, and do that. Again, I say this is because this could go on for a while. Um, this could go on for a while. So I think we need to prepare uh, and, and not just uh, fall back into this trap thinking that things are going to get uh, better in a few months time. Um, longer term, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for the government to restructure the economy. Uh, take, a, take a step back, look at what's worked, what's not working. Um, and this is the time to swap things around. Um, you know, I mentioned about tourism. Uh, the other bigger beneficiary would be uh, to try to get um, manufacturing facilities to come and set up in Malaysia, right? Um, especially as they try to move away from, from China. I know Vietnam has been the beneficiaries of that. Um, the other one is uh, um, government uh, crowding out effect of, um, of the business, right? We own a lot of things um, in Malaysia, the government. And that crowds out a lot of entrepreneurs um, and it stifles also um, a, a lot of uh, creativity. Um, from, a, from a cash handout perspective, and I'm, I'm no big fan of subsidies, but we are in, a, in a, a bizarre situation right now where there must be assistance given from the government, be it from wage subsidy or, or cash handout or whatever. Uh, but it should be tied again to a national objective, right? You know, it shouldn't just be uh, money being thrown and then say, let's hope that things get better six months from now and we'll go back to our lives. But um, if, for example, the government is giving out uh, money to say SMEs or businesses, it must be tied to um, uh, a demand on their side. Um, to, to, you know, to Kamala's point, you know, if, that, if the, you want to reduce foreign workers, it cannot be done tomorrow you know you can't issue a policy guideline saying tomorrow i'm turning the tap off put a timeline three years five years i'm giving you this amount of of wage subsidy support but in through three years five years time i would like to see you reduce your foreign worker by x amount or and increase your minimum wage by this amount so i think that is that is the opportunity the government has with with, with all the cash handouts that they're giving and and they should be able to kind of demand their expectations of what how the businesses uh, should look like um, the other one is, uh, uh, again, it's a longer term, a restructuring of our tax system. Um, and our tax system really doesn't um, capture um, the true wealth um, that is out there. Um, you know, our income tax system is not really robust enough. You know, we've got nearly about 13 million people working or, or have wages. Um, and, um, you know, about slightly under 2 million are registered taxpayers. And, of that amount, uh, you know, something like less than 80,000 people are actually paying the top tier tax, right? It just doesn't make sense, um, you know? So I think there, there needs to be um, a discussion about that. I know it's probably the wrong time to be talking about that, but you know, it's something the government should start uh, thinking about. And, and uh, my last point is also uh, GLC reforms, right? Um, this ties hand in hand with um, them owning too much of, of of Malaysia in general, but also just to um, this obsession of ownership, um, you know, that we must own in order to control, uh, which is not the right thing. Um, you know, that we can allow entrepreneurs to flourish. Um, the best creativity comes from competition, not from monopoly. Um, and, 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 that is, and, and that is how you create a very vibrant um, uh, economy uh, longer term. Um, so those are longer term things, but shorter term, really, I would like to see some direction, obviously, on, on how this uh, pandemic will be contained. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Talil. Um, lots of interesting points there that um, we'll be keen to uh, drill back into. Um, so I'm pleased to hand over to our fourth panelist now. Um, so, um, uh, sorry. Uh, Nalita Omar is a research director at the Center, uh, a centrist think tank based in KL. Uh, her, her career background includes research, government policy development, and management consulting. And her research interests cover political economy, behavioral economics, race relations, and democracy. So all very relevant themes. So over to you now. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, can you hear me all right? 
Okay, wonderful. Um, thanks, Lawrence, and thank you, Ideas, for inviting me um, to present uh, today's uh, really interesting panel discussion. Um, so I think I will use uh, the slides that I uh, concocted yesterday, late, <laughs> after looking at the budget. Um, so what I would like to echo though first is um, yeah, the takes that all of my panelists have shared uh, in uh, first looking at the budget. Um, I did have the sense that it would have been better if um, the budget had been, um, had been separated into what was short term, uh, medium term, i.e. what are we going to do to get over this, you know, this current really unprecedented time that we are uh, facing. And long term, so we can talk about you know, more actual things. And there will be a level of overlap between the two, but it would have still been, you know, a good framing of how the money is being spent. Because as Dr. Juta mentioned, it is the largest budget ever, and uh, it's not just in terms of spending, but also the largest budget ever, probably in terms of uh, revenue foregone. Um, so in, yeah, in terms of like taxes foregone, for instance. Um, so if it had been separated into short, medium term versus longer term, then we would be able to perhaps be able to uh, pull back maybe a sense of disquiet over the level of government involvement in the economy in the coming months or years, because then we be judged between two. And so uh, this is where, um, this is how I viewed the budget going in yesterday. I wanted to see really, I was much more interested in what were the short to medium term measures rather than the longer term measures, because I wanted to see how can we better judge the effectiveness of stimulus measures, i.e. things that are supposed to um, be able to get us through this period, right? But would have a somewhat hard or soft stop to it when uh, these you know, challenging times are somewhat over or tapering out. So um, here I'd like to just um, you know, center ourselves back in you know, like thinking about the short-term measures, right? So um, I'm coining here the word, the phrase COVID normal because um, I, I guess I'm a pragmatist by nature. I don't foresee us uh, coming up with a, you know, a really novel approach about how to deal with this pandemic in, uh, anytime soon. So this uh, strategy, for want of a better word, of going into stop start, going into lockdown and you know, releasing the lockdown, I think it's going to be with us for uh, the foreseeable future. Unless of course there's you know, some novel drug that, uh, that can be taken to, uh, to shorten the effects of the virus because uh, the vaccine as um, I think Jello has mentioned and Carmelo was also, um, it's, it's probably not going to be with us for quite a while given you know, uh, how much it's gonna cost, how many people want it, and also whether it's going to be effective. Um, so yeah, we're going to have COVID normal times for a while. Um, it is unclear though, how long that's going to be. Uh, and so we're dealing with uh, uncertainty, right? We're always going to be uh, moving the goalposts around. Uh, it could be six months, 12 months, 18 months, but if we're going to be really conservative about things, let's say the next 12 to 24 months. So this kind of time horizon, what, what kind of criteria are we thinking about here, right? Um, I think that we should be thinking about um, judging the stimulus measures based on three things. One, whether it's going to generate new spending in the economy. And this means basically putting money into the pockets of households, putting money uh, into the pockets of firms. Um, not necessarily rewarding old spending either. So I'm not talking about, you know, um, uh, sorry, investments, uh, tax investments for old uh, investments. I'm talking about um, measures that is going to uh, promote new investments and new spending in the economy. This also means that the investment or spending needs to come from consumption. So kind of uh, measures that go, for instance, um, to the rich, uh, it's probably going to be saved rather than spent. So a lot of the measures that I want to talk about is um, going to uh, necessarily be more of a um, cash transfer or subsidy uh, kind of measure. Uh, the second assessment criteria, I think, is whether it's going to be spendable in time. So for, for this reason, this is another uh, reason why I would not be touching on uh, things like large infrastructural programs. Those uh, types of investments are probably going to be awarded really late in the year. And if we really want to keep the economy ticking very, very quickly, um, uh, investments need to be made quite quite early in the year, Q1, Q2. 
Um, the third criteria that I'd like to advance is that it doesn't create long-term distortions or dependencies traps. And this is, I think, I mean, it speaks back to um, something that Carmelo mentioned uh, in his uh, remarks is that uh, there is a risk that certain things that get um, uh, that get announced, uh, even though there is a time cap or a limitation um, put on it, uh, because of the uh, political situation currently, it may actually be extended um, to be much longer than anybody uh, had expected in the uh, in the first place. So. Uh, devising these uh, short-term measures uh, is really important to be really clear when the duration is going to be, uh, when it's going to stop, and or uh, how how much the cap is. Um, so, uh, okay, so I must apologize in advance for uh, coming up with some very, very ugly slides, but <laughs> this was a uh, basically what um, me and my team put together very quickly right after the budget, just to give you a sense of where we are thinking about these uh, different stimulus measures. So, um, and uh, don't worry, I won't go through like 20 of these. <laughs> so, but it's just to give an idea about, you know, how should we think about this, right? Um, so money in households pockets. Um, I think, Politically, we all come from a, you know, a spectrum here and you know, some may be more in favor uh, of these measures than others uh, for, uh, you know, uh, yeah, for various political reasons. For me, um, I think that it is a good measure in just in terms of putting money in people's pockets because this is all going to uh, turn out in consumption, right? So the increase in Bantuan Perhatian Rakyat, I think it's going to put in new spending in the economy. It's going to probably come in time if they disburse it very quickly. Um, uh, is it going to create long-term dependency traps? Um, arguably, no, uh, for me, because um, the Bantuan Sarah Hidup has been uh, basically in the system for quite a while now. And uh, this is essentially an increase on that. And the increase has been stated as to be temporary. So, but yes, uh, I understand politics, but in in sense of uh, being able to put money into people's pockets in the very, very short term, I think is pretty good, um, but, uh, I think that higher amounts should have gone to the lower income uh, households because it would have uh, it would have gone through in consumption uh, much faster and uh, in much greater amounts. Um, next, targeted loan moratorium or installment reduction for the B40 and the M40. Will it create new spending in the economy? Yes. Um, will it come in time? Absolutely, especially if this is uh, done in very early in the year. Um, it is temporary. Um, it is supposed to end, uh, I think, within the next uh, 12 months. So I think this is pretty good. Um, only, only though, with the, uh, with the caveat that uh, the process announced in the budget, i.e. of self-declaration that your income has been reduced, that really, is, uh, that really works. Um, because uh, for people who don't have a job, if they are freelancers or if they are business owners, sometimes it can, this can be a little bit difficult to prove uh, documentation-wise. Um, okay, the next, this is really controversial. EPF workers contribution rate reduction, uh, account one withdrawal. Um, will it put new money into the economy? Yes. Will it come in time? Yes. Uh, Long-term distortion or dependency? Probably not, it's temporary. It's capped at like $500 a month uh, for 12 months. Um, but okay, uh, this is increasing the risk for uh, retirement spending, uh, retirement savings down the road. So I qualify this with a good-ish um, assessment. Reduction, next, reduction of individual income tax rate by 1% for the 50 to 70K band. Um, new spending, potentially yes. In time, no. This is gonna come after 2021, if at all. And uh, does it create a long-term dependency? Maybe, politically, it's very hard to take back. So for me, this is a bad assessment. It is a high cost for relatively small payoff in the, um, yeah, in the amount of money that goes back into the economy. Um, I have another slide on households, but I'm going to skip that <laughs> for, in the interest of time. I think um, I just want to go through very quickly uh, the stimulus measures for firms. Um, so there were various government maintenance works, uh, small infrastructure projects, targeted sectoral spending, like for instance on agriculture, spend, uh, tourism, et cetera. Uh, is this going to put in new spending? Yes. Is it going to be in time? Depends on the project size, the efficiency of the agency, et cetera. Uh, is this going to create dependency traps? Again, it depends on the manner of the award, et cetera. Um, I think that 
this is mostly good. I'd like to qualify that. Um, I would have liked to have seen measures that were not all fiscal in nature. So for instance, um, um, Jalil mentioned this, tourism, extremely, extremely um, important sector um, in great difficulty right now. I would have loved to hear something about creating or establishing travel bubbles, right? Um, or, or, or some other kind of um, strategy that is going to uh, happen in the medium term. For example, I think Thailand is going great guns in trying to um, uh, in trying to work with the pandemic situation and reviving their uh, tourism sector by inviting long term tourists into the country. So uh, you are compensated for your quarantine period and you get to spend like three, six months, nine months living in Thailand and working from there. And that's a, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic way to think about how to work with uh, what you've got. Um, and I would have loved to hear more of that coming from our budget. Um, preferential tax rates for manufacturers or companies relocating to Malaysia. I'm with uh, Carmelo on this. Um, it's good. Uh, it doesn't really require money uh, in terms of spending. It's just uh, income foregone. Um, and apparently this uh, has been announced with limited duration as well. So it shouldn't create any long-term distortions or, or dependencies. Plus they had, uh, the government had announced that there's going to be a review of the effectiveness of these kinds of tax incentives as well. Uh, so it's not just, you know, money thrown willy nilly. So it's good. Uh, I'm going to end on uh, the note of this expanded wage subsidy programs. So I split this into two current employees and new employees, right? So for current employees, no, it's not really new spending because it's already been budgeted for, but it preserves spending. So actually, this is a kind of yes, right, for the new spending column. In time, definitely. Uh, long term distortion, well, no, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's been announced to be temporary wage subsidy. So I think the you know, employers would have factored that in, costed that in. Um, so I think this is mostly good and it's, a, it's supposed to affect a, a, a huge number of uh, workers. But um, I think certain sectors should have higher wage subsidy per worker than others because they've just been harder hit. And um, yeah, some uh, um, uh, differentiation of the wage subsidy according to sector would have been very welcome. Um, wage subsidy for hiring new employees though. And this, I think, goes back to the point uh, that uh, Carmelo made about, um, about looking at the effectiveness of how money is being spent or money is being allocated, right? Uh, yes, it will put new money uh, into the economy. Um, will it happen in time? Um, don't know. It depends on it depends on the hiring that's done, and that depends on the farm, right? So, um, okay, I don't think it's going to create any long-term distortions or dependency traps because it's supposed to be temporary. But um, again, I mean, the verdict is 50-50, right? This is, there was a low cap on the maximum amount that you can, uh, that you can have uh, in terms of this wage subsidy, right? So it looks as if it's mostly aimed at SMEs. It's only for six months. So it's probably going to be low take up on this, on this because you know, as an SME, you have lived through a, a really a roller coaster of a year. Uh, and if you're going into 2021, pretty pessimistic uh, about uh, the potential of uh, another lockdown, two, three lockdowns, depending on the virus, um, you are not going to go that step and take on uh, you know, additional staff um, just because you're going to get um, $600 off your salary a month. Um, so uh, these are some of the thoughts that we had about the measures and um, yeah, I think, I hope that we, we would have um, clearer criteria about how to assess the effectiveness of government spending um, uh, based on short term versus uh, longer term measures. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Nell. Uh, that's a really helpful uh, like rubric, I think, for thinking about the specific measures and I'm sure a lot of the uh, participants will join me in hoping that you make those slides uh, available on your website or that you'll be publishing that, that analysis because I think that's a really, really helpful tool. Sure. Great. Well, thank you so much for four really interesting um, uh, presentations or, or, or sets of commentary that I think both give us an insight into yesterday's announcement, but also, uh, you know, as I hoped, kind of connect to some broader themes. Um, so we've got, I mean, at half past, but I might uh, run on a little bit. Um, so please do bear with us. Um, uh, please share any questions in the Q&A. We've already received some, and I see that Juito has already kindly provided some responses. 
Uh, but I probably will come back to Juita on the issue of SDGs specifically since that's been raised. Um, but um, I'll also take the uh, opportunity, I think, to ask a few questions of my own, weaved in with the questions from the participants. So I think I wanted to um, just come back, I think firstly, just come back to Carmelo and, and, and ask a question about the, the kind of openness to FDI and why what might underpin some of the, the, the kind of less enthusiastic uh, feeling about that in, in, the, in the country. So, and I think if we were to sort of steel man that position, you know, like in, take that, interpret it in the most, um, you know, generous way possible, that it's not sort of just very simple political short-termism. I think that, that you know there is a, a concern that you know Malaysia, of course, has been a uh, highly open economy um, that performed very well, but then we have seen some drop off in terms of productivity gains since around 2000. That the FDI that we've had in manufacturing has remained relatively labour intensive, and whether or not the gains from manufacturing in terms of spillovers to the wider economy and uh, or sorry, not just manufacturing, but FDI in general, you know, spillovers to the wider economy, how, how broadly based have those gains, gains been? So I think it'd be interesting to hear, you know, your kind of repudiation of that and, and or, uh, or your just perspective on it. Like, how do you see the argument against uh, FDI and openness as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as the, sorry, that's grounded in terms of not generating broad-based gains for the Malaysian economy, and, and, and how would you respond to that? Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, I think that uh, the starting, one of the starting points for, for answering this is also considering that Malaysia is a small country. Uh, we are not talking about China or India, where potentially, I mean, you have the potential to develop a huge uh, domestic market for everything and to differentiate uh, very widely uh, your productions. So this, I think, is, uh, is one important point. Um, consider that uh, the kind of FDIs that have reached here in many occasions have been um, for regional purposes. In fact, Maida uh, decades ago issued a principal hub scheme that was a very good one in attracting uh, foreign direct investments. Because um, the attractiveness of Malaysia for a multinational company is not Malaysia as a market. In Malaysia is a country of 30, 30 million people. We are surrounded by Philippines with 100 million, Indonesia with almost 300 million, Thailand close to 100 million, and etc. And it's also a country in which labor is not cheap, like, um, like uh, uh, in, the, in the neighbor countries. So the reason why Malaysia was able to attract FDIs was the institutional framework. Political stability um, is relatively easy to set up a business. You can have uh, a company 100% foreign owned, and this is not an issue. Um, the labor legislation was not too bad. Consider that we already have restrictions in hiring not only uh, foreign workers, but also expatriates. Even before the current, the current regulation, um, you need to have a minimum paid up capital. You need to get the approval for hiring expatriates and to prove that the expatriate that you want to hire has skills that are not available in the local market. So there were already some regulations to avoid uh, overstaffing, but an overstaffing of expatriates that actually nobody is interested in. So these are important elements that I think uh, we need to consider. So Malaysia is attractive only by virtue of its institutional framework. So if that institutional framework benefit is not in place anymore, and this is also uh, accompanied by uh, an increase in political uh, instability that uh, then Malaysia lose all its uh, fascination. Um, then uh, probably your question is why Malaysia should be actually interested in, uh, uh, in attracting FDIs. Um, first of all, I think 
uh, is uh, obvious that uh, multinational companies that invest here do not hire only foreigners. They hire only lo also locals. And uh, I think that the percentage of locals over foreigners also for qualified position has been constantly growing over the year. So it's, it's a, I also run the local office for a multinational company. I'm the only expatriate in the company. I have fantastic talents working for me. Some of them, I even picked them up from the university when I was a lecturer and I, and I brought them with me. I, grow, I grew them and now they, they are very good professionals with very, very important skills and I cannot renounce to that. So this is, cannot be um, uh, underestimated. So um, in terms of productivity, I think that this is uh, um, more related to the quality of the educational system uh, rather than uh, with uh, the, our uh, product production system and production process uh, anyhow. I think this is very important. I think that uh, um, in general, um, the kind of education system that, that we have uh, doesn't, doesn't drive productivity. It creates good executors and uh, tend not to develop um, critical skills and critical approach to things. But in order to address that, I think that we need to address the educational system rather than uh, the, 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 production, uh, the, the production scenario. This is, uh, this is one issue. Um, the, the, the second issue is uh, obviously that by creating works, you will create consumption. Uh, you have people uh, uh, spending money in the country, uh, more availability, and consider that usually the, the, the pays in multinational companies are, uh, are higher than uh, the pays in local companies. This statistically, I think, has been proved. And I can see that whenever I post for my company uh, a job on LinkedIn for the fact that we are a multinational company, I get applications from whoever even doesn't have any, any of the qualifications that are required for the position. So I have engineers that are apply for an accountant position because we are a multinational company. And it is well known that multinational companies pay higher wages uh, than, uh, than local companies. So uh, if we think about uh, the positive effect, indeed the competition from multinational companies force also local companies to somehow rethink their wage policy if you want to attract uh, the best talents. And uh, probably there is a cultural issue in some of the small and medium enterprises here that, that I see is similar to, to the one of my country of origin is that often they don't give the right value to human capital. So every person can be replaced by someone else. And this is not important. And probably the competition, an open environment, a competitive environment from the labor perspective. So the competition brought in by multinational companies is also um, helping, helping on that. Great. Thank you very much, Carmelo. I think lots of uh, interesting points there. Um, okay, I'm going to pick up some questions uh, from the from the Q&A box. Uh, I'm going to link two questions together. So um, Maslan asks for comments from the panelists on the assistance towards the M40 in yesterday's budget. Uh, and then linked to that, I'm going to connect that with the question from Zaria, which is what do you think of the government's call in regards to the moratorium? So the loan moratorium obviously attracted a lot of attention and was one of those measures that obviously applied across the economy. Um, but then has been sort of transitioned into a more targeted thing. And I, I'm connecting it to that question on the M40 because I think it's about, you know, how do we move from economy-wide measures to targeted measures and, and then how do we target them? Uh, so I'll come first to J Jalil on this, on yeah. the moratorium and the M40. Yeah, so the, the moratorium, um, clearly it was needed. Um, but, you know, the, the first moratorium that we had was a blanket one where you had to opt out if you felt that you didn't need it. Um, whereas now it, it, the onus is on you to go. Um, the only concern I have with this is how many of them um, would be uh, evaluated fairly? Um, you know, is it, is it um, you losing your job and then you qualify? Um, let's not also forget that there are many people who are now taking big wage cuts 
and working maybe three days a week rather than five days. And I would argue that they also would qualify for that. You know, um, so I think that that is the implementation of that or how many people are realistically going to be beneficiaries of that um, opt uh, in uh, is what I, um, I kind of struggle with because different banks can have different ways of how they want to um, evaluate your, your application. Um, so, um, and then for the, the moratorium on the part of small businesses, um, that there, there was not much um, announcement on, on that. Um, you know, it does go um, hand in hand as well, right? Because small, small businesses are uh, single entrepreneurs. Um, and if they don't get that uh, benefit, uh, it, may, it may affect their cash flow as well, their ability to kind of pay uh, for uh, the business. So it, 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 is, it is very, very interlinked um, because, you know, in Malaysia, as you know, um, we've got like something like 10 million SMEs and they like, they uh, hire something like 80% of our total workforce. Um, so they are absolutely crucial. Um, and on average, SMEs in Malaysia have cash flows of about six weeks uh, from, from the research that we did in the past. Um, and, you know, all you need is a two, three week shutdown and then they go back to the drawing board. Then they need more financing. So I think uh, that must be looked at um, together. So my, my, uh, my take on that is great that it's there. My concern is how many people would, who really need it would get it easily and will be eligible for it. Great, thanks, Chalil. Uh, Nell, do you want to weigh in on the on the moratorium too, and then also on the? Do you feel that the M forty have sort of fallen out of the of the sort of scope of the stimulus um, as we've switched to the more targeted approach? Mm, okay, yeah, I'll uh, take the moratorium first. Um, I agree with Jalil. Um, and to be honest, I, I if I had heard uh, uh, an announcement of a blanket moratorium, I would have been extremely worried because you know um, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and I would start wondering how this is going to be paid for. Um, and also um, bearing in mind that eighty five percent of uh, the borrowers that um, have now had to you know pay back their loans are now servicing their loans. So um, it's, it's such a high rate of loan repayment right now that I think there is, um, there is capacity uh, to pay back loans in the, uh, you know, um, especially for the T20, definitely. Um, the M40 though, um, so it is a relief to hear that there is room for uh, at least reducing your loan installment, if not a complete moratorium uh, on your loan. But yeah, um, I, I, right after the moratorium was lifted, um, uh, I did like a quick dipstick survey of, um, of different banks, basically just going in and asking, you know, um, what would it take for me to extend the moratorium, right? Um, so this little exercise of opting in, um, yeah, I mean, it showed that uh, it's not easy. Uh, so I would have had to show that um, uh, in some form of official documentation, that uh, my income had indeed been reduced. So unless I had a letter from an employer, um, that is going, it's going to be very difficult and it would take basically a bank that is particularly um, conscientious or proactive to, you know, um, to write in rules that would allow, for instance, the uh, um, freelancers uh, or business owners um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, self-declaration of income reduction. So yeah, it does come down to what are the processes involved in, uh, in making sure or, or in assessing that people are eligible uh, for this. If there were guidelines coming from government, that would be actually pretty good because yeah, if it's up to the different banks, we're going to see like very uneven implementation of this um, policy. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, just broader stimulus though, uh, for the M40, um, it, uh, the, there does seem to be some coverage, um, but it is very small, uh, very small amounts in the new uh, Bantuan Sarahidop, for instance. Um, but I think, yeah, a lot of it is probably going to come through the wage subsidies, which is why looking at, um, looking at the level of wage subsidy per employee, um, that's going to be very important. Um, they raised the cap from 200 employees per um, company now to 500 employees per company, which is good, which might actually translate to coverage of the M40. Um, but yeah, the, the amounts per employee is actually going to be very important. Thanks so much, Nell. Yeah, I think there's a, 
I think it's really interesting what you said on the moratorium and whether that will be needed, like centralized guidelines from the government or from Magnagara on what are the criteria and how they should be applied. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if, 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 if that comes forth, because I think that's something that people are raising as a, as a risk, you know, the sort of difference in bank requirements. And earlier in, the, earlier in this whole journey, back in March, April, we were having big, pro big problems with disbursement of a lot of the loan facilities. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if that gets kind of locked up. Uh, Dr. Juita, I want to come back to you and pick up on the SDGs because there are a couple of questions that you answered in the chat that um, I just want to highlight for the rest of the participants um, and also kind of crowbar in a question of my own. So I, I felt like the government was setting quite a lot of expectation around sustainability um, ahead of the budget. And I my interpretation of it was that there was good sort of um, signal of the importance of sustainability to the government and you know important you know supporting the the parliamentary working group for example and these things but when we talk about and i know the sdgs are incredibly broad um and cover you know every kind of aspect of economic development but for me also we we have to talk about um the climate and environment in that context i think and to me that's where i'm a little bit disappointed that the government is not signaling um, more clearly the direction on transition to a low carbon economy. I think Malaysia is in a position where, you know, we, we recognize the need to do it, but obviously given the high dependence of fossil fuels in various ways, whether it's petrol subsidies or Petronas dividend or coal for our electricity or, or you know, and, and other sustainability issues such as palm oil. I think it, it feels like the scope of the current policies aren't sufficient to match that challenge. Um, so could you just please comment on, you know, where you see the direction of sustainability, you know, the, the breadth of the SDGs for sure, but like specifically on some of those issues and whether you think the budget is, is, a, is an indication that we're going to make progress in those areas. Um, that is a very, very difficult question indeed. Um, so when it comes to the SDGs, I think in the past, um, different blueprints and different master plans and different RMKs have tried to incorporate um, the goals, but not um, the SDG goals per se. Um, indirectly, we see that um, there always has been a, a policy on um, on employment, job creation, wage inequality, income inequality, and and so and so forth. But I, what I feel um, is a bit more encouraging this time around is that the RMK12, which will which will be tabled next year, will incorporate SDG goals into our development plan, and this has not been done so explicitly before. So I'm not, um, um, ISIS has been in conversation and in um, um, talks with, um, with Topa and um, also with the EPU and um, they're very excited to include uh, the SDG goals within the plans, but um, before next year, I would not be able to tell you what those uh, uh, detailed policies would be. But again, this is good because we see that our government is more aware of SDGs and more aware of the importance of SDGs in um, um, policy, in, in, in government planning and in, in like um, country planning in the development, um, in our development pathways. And what is different from, um, uh, what is different this time around for the RMK, RMK 12 again, it's not just the SDG goals being talked about between government to government, but again, it will trickle down 5 million this year will trickle down to the communities. So this is where it's a bit different than uh, all the previous plans before. And that's what I think. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Chuita. Um, okay, I wanna pick up the question on EPF. Um, so I'm gonna uh, post that to Carmelo and Nell, I think in, in, in a moment. But first I just want to put a question to Jalil. Um, um, which, which I'm afraid I'll admit is my own, but um, I, I, I want to ask about the role of GLCs. Um, I think it's something that Kamala mentioned, you mentioned as well. I think it's been really interesting that the budget has featured, you know, the sort of job creation schemes like led by the GLCs. And I just wanted to ask your perspective on, on, on sort of how that, how that kind of works in practice. 
So I think, you know, one test we can apply is Nell's, you know, is it going to happen in time? You know, how, how reactive and how responsive can the GLC landscape be? Um, and, and, and how do you see that impacting the broader economy? And then also just, I'd be interested to understand, you know, how that kind of works. I mean, I get that the government, say, for example, has full control, say, of Petronas, but many of the GLCs have other shareholders. Like, how does that relationship, like, what scope does the government really have, actually, to turn to Maybank and say, you need to hire 10,000 more people? Um, and and how, do, how do the GLCs kind of manage these, these sort of, uh, these 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 in, these instructions, um, given that they have, you know, their commercial enterprises that are subject to minority shareholder interest and the regulation of the Securities Commission and whatever else. Yeah. So yeah, it'd be great to hear your your yeah. take on that. Yeah. So this um, GLC job creation has been has been going on for a while, right? You know, it's it's always that we we need to create a new entity. Uh, let's say it's been it's been really a way to create uh, more jobs. Um, how effective has it been? Uh, my answer to that is not been very effective, right? It's created a big drag on the economy. Uh, it's probably one of the reasons why, comp uh, you know, we're not very competitive. From a timeline perspective, um, it's not going to be able to uh, be set up uh, when, when you really need the jobs, right? This goes through an insane amount of bureaucracy um, you know, uh, at, at multiple levels within the firm, then to the stakeholders, then to the government, um, and then by which time it's set up, you've completely, um, you know, missed that time frame that you actually needed to create that job, right? And then you're then saddled with this entity that's been set up, you've hired people, what do you do? Can't get rid of people in, in, within the government sphere. Um, so you're, you're left there. Uh, and more entities such as that is created, you know, which is why to my earlier opening point, I did say that the government must step back away from business, right? This obsession of ownership must end. Um, and there are already enough infrastructure within the country to enable um, jobs to be, um, to be created, for example. Um, you know, if they wanted to create more jobs uh, and they're willing to pump in money for that, there are entities already available that can be mobilized to do that, right? The, and then the second point is using GLCs. And um, you know, obviously I have a very, very uh, 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 clear stand on this. Uh, it's, it's just outright wrong, right? You know, and then first of all, the government must define what is a GLC. That definition is used uh, very, very broadly here from uh, statutory boards right up to publicly listed companies, right? Uh, if you're a statutory board, you are a government facilitation agency. Um, so you are somewhat linked to the ministry. You do make decisions, fine. But if you're a listed company and you own 51%, you're not the sole shareholder. You've got 49% of other people that you need to listen to, right? Um, and there lies the problem that 51% is used as this uh, golden bullet to kind of do anything, uh, which is wrong. And it leads to a lot of other things, right? This can be, um, you know, something from nominating a particular individual to, to be on the board, right up to uh, directing how business decisions uh, are made, right? Um, and, and so I, I'm, I'm not in favor of that. Um, realistically, I think to be fair to GLCs in Malaysia, from experience, a lot of them do push back, uh, especially when it's uh, when um, it's not commercially uh, viable. But I think that that's that's the point where um, it really depends on how you can engage the stakeholders um, at 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 Putrajaya to kind of give a sensible take about how destructive certain directions can be longer term for the economy right um you know this can be anything about um oh you know uh, forgive this forgive that you know it's okay you know let's take it for the team and everything else like okay but you know the, you do cause a systemic problem on on a particular banking system as well right um i saw one interesting question in the, in the chat group which is related to this about you know, we've been talking about this for a while, GLCs, reforms, why is it not happening towards political will? 
Um, you know, I think if, if there is, if, if from the top, they say we need to change, get it done. Um, do we have the talent to do it? Absolutely, yes. Um, there are a lot of people out there uh, who, who just need that, um, need that word go and they will go out there and, and change things. But, you know, um, but in that process, you do get a lot of, you know, blockages coming from, uh, from in between. And that really is what drives us down, right? Um, if you say that the government owns a very small portion of the business in, in Malaysia, uh, we wouldn't be talking about this because it won't really move the needle so much for the economy. Uh, but they do own and you know a lot of uh, businesses in Malaysia. So how they behave um, does um, does uh, kind of affect the economy in the in the broader sense. Um, so no, we should not be using GLCs. Um, I think if we want to create jobs, uh, which is which is uh, a noble intention. Uh, we shouldn't recreate the wheel. Uh, we should use existing um, uh, entities who have done it very well. I mean, even at job scaling, to what uh, Carmelo said, you know, we create entities just to train people, whereas there are people who have done reskilling and retraining for for so many years, for decades, and they can do it efficiently tomorrow. Um, so if the government wants to pump money, they can go in there. So. Uh, with with GLCs kind of slowly withdrawing away from business, there must be also a decentralization in the ways, way we think. Right? Currently, it's a very uh, centralized command and control model, um, which is very dependent on the political situation of the day, which makes it in this current environment extremely tricky because nobody, nothing gets done. Uh, to be honest, nothing gets done because everyone is thinking, okay, you know, would would instructions change tomorrow? Um, you know, so I think we need to de-risk ourselves politically um, and, and institutionalize over the longer term. Thanks, Janelle. Uh, Laura, sorry, if I could just, just yeah, add on a tiny bit to that. Um, yeah. Okay, when I looked at the budget speech, right, as to the uh, that particular announcement, I thought, oh my goodness, um, well, uh, what a cost to this announcement because actually the number of uh, so-called uh, jobs, right, is actually short term. These are short term um, employment contracts that's, prob that's just going to last six months. So it creates, you know, unintended consequences from there politically, um, right, if it's like for GLCs, if, if it really goes through, as uh, Jalil said, there's a whole bunch of bureaucracy and I would be surprised by the end of 2021, how many people are actually hired you know, by uh, this particular government directive, if it is in, indeed a directive. What I was really more worried about was the, okay, it's not a high number, it's only 30,000 people, but yeah, there are supposed to be 30,000 short-term employed people that will go into government payroll and they will come, they will be um, for, dip, for a range of jobs such as that, you know, medical attend, uh, yeah, uh, uh, staff nurses or assistant nurses, you know, uh, and, and such jobs if this is going to stay on the books for longer than six months because of politics, then yeah, that creates really unintended uh, distortions, right? Because we're already talking about a really, um, a really bloated um, uh, civil service uh, payroll. So um, I think it's, uh, uh, we have to look at uh, the number of people uh, that have been, that are supposed to be affected by these policies. We have to see whether or not it's actually, um, you know, a big enough number to worry about, but also, yeah, whether it is really going to happen given the political situation that we have currently. And it's probably more, it's probably likely to happen for government servants rather than for GLC staff. I mean, that's my opinion. Thanks so much, Nell. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all of that. And I, I hope to see some kind of evaluation as well, or some at least some tracking here, because I think looking back in previous moments when GLCs have been used um, in this sort of quasi public development role, um, I'm thinking of like the vendor development programs, for example, I, I, I just find like there's not enough like solid evaluation of how those actually work and, and do we kind of hold the government and the GLCs to account in terms of, of, of kind of the, the, the the costs and benefits of doing that. Um, so I hope we see that in this sort of new kind of job creation push. Um, okay, I wanna pick up, I'm gonna to have to end reasonably soon. Uh, I'm gonna try and end in 10 minutes. So but I just wanna pick up one question, uh, sorry, another question in the, in the chat, um, which is about the EPF withdrawals. So I think, you know, my own, I, I, I worry a bit when I look at, um, 
you know, the status of, uh, you know, the financial sustainability of households over the long term. I think we've got another panel later today uh, with Noor Hisham from EPF, where I'm sure he will talk about this and the, you know, the financial vulnerability. But at the same time, it's a way to release some money into the economy, as we saw from Nell's slide. So I think it's a real trade off with how we should manage EPF withdrawals and also bearing in mind it's not the government's money, right? It's, it's the people's money. So um, Carmelo, can you just kind of give us your take on the EPF withdrawal as a sort of policy tool at this time yeah. and the EPF uh, reductions in contribution? Yeah. Um, okay, uh, just let me quickly give a thought on the GLC and subsidies. Um, just very quick, from a pure economics perspective, something that we have to be very careful whenever we talk about uh, subsidies, uh, money injection, uh, uh, political hiring uh, or political employment, uh, in order to, what they say usually from a Keynesian perspective, stimulate the aggregate demand. So you give money to the people, they spend, the economy will fly. Um, I'm quite skeptical on, the, on this uh, simplistic reasonment for a simple reason, uh, long-term consequences. You pump money in the economy in different forms, in forms of political hiring, in forms of wages. These give power spending to the people, uh, spending power, sorry, to the people. People start to spend and they indeed make the economy grow. But this is a growth which is somehow uh, inflated by, by drugs, okay? So what happened when are you going to withdraw that, uh, that support? It will happen that not only the people that were relying on that support will be in trouble, but also that economic initiatives, that uh, jump that was created was more hiring, more economic activity that was created thanks to that drug somehow will suffer. So the potential negative shock that will happen when the, 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 the subsidies are removed or then can be worse than the initial, than the starting situation. So we have to be extremely careful uh, when we discuss these measures because all these things, of course, politicians never have a medium or long-term strategy because they just look at the, their electoral term. Uh, but sooner or later, the consequences can be very, uh, very, very important and even worse than uh, the disease that we wanted to, to cure. This related to subsidies. So coming back to EPF. So there was the question on the, on the percentage, on the employee percentage. And this is one issue. Um, uh, of course, this is applied on a voluntary basis, so the employees can opt not to choose that. And I think that this is the right direction where to go, because for some employees within a certain income categories, that reduction can be indeed fundamental for their short-term survival, financial survival. For others, can be of no difference, and so they can opt not to, to, to do that, that reduction. So I, I, li I like the idea that this on a voluntary basis. Um, and this can be of help. Also on the EPF withdrawal instead, I have quite mixed feelings in the sense that is going to obviously undermine um, the, the, the savings for, for the future. But I also understand that in the present circumstance, uh, people that have no job, that they remain out of jobs, that lost their economic activity, um, can, can be in the need for cash to support their own existence and the existence of their family. And, and, I, and I know some of these situations and probably the EPF withdrawal can be the less distorsive way for these people uh, to remain afloat. Um, again, obviously, um, what I would like to see is to have these temporary measures accompanied by a more long-term strategy for economic recovery, because we can help the people with temporary measures, but temporary measures are temporary. And if we don't think um, uh, contextually to a long-term strategy, then that measure sooner or later will exhaust their potential and we will put the people even in in more, uh, in more deep troubles. Thanks very much, Carmelo. Now, do you have any 
comments on the on the EPF withdrawal and whether it's the the, the balance between financial sustainability in the long term. You, I think you categorized it as a good but in your yeah yeah I mean I'm not for it the trade-off is like uh, I mean it's it's very high and you know uh, I, I still stand by uh, I still stand by the assessment that it does put back money into um, you know uh, in people's pockets that is going to end up as consumption in the economy mm. but yes if it creates you know this consumption on drugs as uh, you know Dr. Carmela said um, that is that is a question, um, especially given the amount uh, and you know when that is taken away. I, I think the hope is that the economy would move, um, you know, to or would um, would grow to a certain level that uh, yeah, it can be taken away uh, at a particular point when people are you know starting to um, maybe uh, get back their full working hours or you know go back on uh, getting uh, their usual salaries or even uh, you know. Uh, touch wood bonuses <laughs> so yeah um it's uh I, but yeah I, I and but i think this is coming more from uh to be honest uh, a moral slash uh po political point of view for me i i feel that the trade-off is too high um and uh, it would be interesting actually to hear what um uh what nor hisham is going to say later in the afternoon about this because he would have a much you know a yeah, more detailed understanding about which kinds of people would be most likely to take it out and yeah, what will be the repercussions on them in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Nell. Um, okay, I, I just want to try and squeeze in one more question to Juita and then I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll give everybody, uh, you know, probably less than a minute just to, to, to offer any final concluding thoughts. Um, Juita, I just wanted to come back to, to, to connect two things. So firstly, you know, you talked about TVET in your presentation, and I just wanted to connect that with something that Carmelo mentioned, which was about, you know, we talk about reskilling, but actually we've also got to talk about whether we're creating actually enough jobs for the skilled graduates that we're trying to produce. And actually that sometimes, you know, actually it seems like some of these measures, which is to try to encourage graduates to taking up jobs that are currently being filled by foreign workers would actually be de-skilling them. Um, I think that is right when you look at the profile of where most of the foreign workers are in Malaysia versus where our unemployment is, is, is greatest among young graduates. So I just wanted to kind of quickly get your thoughts on that mismatch and, and how you see the kind of TVET um, playing into the sort of mismatch and demand between um, our, our young graduates and, and the jobs that are available. That is also a very, very difficult question to answer. Um, so yes, um, in the past few years, we have seen that the availability of jobs for skilled workers is actually much less than those um, job opportunities for unskilled and skilled workers. Um, we saw that for job opportunities or vacancies for um, skilled workers, were only uh, like 30%, it made up 30% and the rest are all like for semi-skilled and also unskilled workers. So again, you mentioned about the mismatch, yes. And um, in normal times, uh, graduate uh, graduates unemployment would make up around 300,000 to 315,000 per year. And this is again, in normal times without the pandemic. But in May of 2020, we saw that um, graduate uh, unemployed or graduates unemployment made up 30% of total unemployment in Malaysia. And this is very, very worrying. So um, again, when it comes to TVET, um, restructuring is um, the main issue here. Um, I, as uh, Dr. Carmelo mentioned earlier, um, there are some things that can be done that do not require allocation of money, allocation of funding. Uh, what is fundamental for our TVET is again, the quality of TVET and again, restructuring is needed. As of now, 17 different ministries are offering TVET programs at all different levels. Maybe at diploma level, certificate level, degree levels. So again, um, we have two different uh, accreditation uh, systems, but again, um, 
who is monitoring um, the uh, quality and also the adherence of um, standards of these TVET um, programs in Malaysia. So again, when you see that there's a mismatch, there is going to be a higher probability of underemployment. And we have seen that during the 1997 financial crisis, whereby um, unemployment rates were very high. Um, those um, who had a different, uh, a specific skill sets needed to um, needed to um, uh, take up jobs that are below their education attainment. And this is also rampant in the past few years, even before the pandemic. So again, uh, the problem on youth employment is not about just creating jobs, it's about creating specific types of jobs and um, to match um, what is being supplied by our institutes, institutions with what is needed in the, by the industry. So that is my take on it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Juvita. Um, I think on that note, I'm going to have to end the discussion, although I've got much more, many more questions I'd like to ask. Um, I'll just I want to hear just kind of once more from each panelist. Um, I'm afraid I have to ask you to keep it very, very brief. But I've been saving this one question. I think Jalil um, referred to it, but I just wanted to read it out um, from Yi Chao Boy. So uh, it says that many of the issues touched on, like big government stifling entrepreneurship, over dependence on labor, restructure of economy, digitalization, technology. These issues have been around for years with different shades of leaders and governments. What is clear is we have not been able to find the solutions or the will to carry out that transformation. So what are the real problems? Um, we don't have the capabilities, we don't have the leaders, we don't have the resources, we're not strategic, or we just don't care and we're content to be where we are. So in your <laughs> 30, 10 seconds each on uh, cracking the underlying problems of Malaysia's political economy. Um, but no, in, in, uh, I think it'd be, if there's any kind of concluding remarks, I think everybody mentions aligned with that question that there are sort of bits and pieces people liked and didn't like in the budget, but a, a theme I think that came throughout was, did it kind of lack the sense of being a turning point in terms of a, providing some vision for, for the longer term? So I think if I could just ask e each panelist in turn, just to give any, any sort of final concluding thoughts on any of the issues that would come up during the discussion or on that sort of big picture question of, of, of where next for the economy. So uh, starting with Dr. Carmelo. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, my Final thought would be that it's not too late uh, to, to engage on a series of reforms that can put Malaysia or really on a recovery path. Uh, but the best way to do so is also uh, for the government to engage with the relevant stakeholders and protagonists in the, in the society, uh, from, from the, the economic society, cultural society, and et cetera. Um, and this would be the, the, the right way to uh, to build something good for the future of the country. Thank you so much, Carmelo. Dr. Chivita. Again, a very difficult question to answer in 10 yes. seconds. But um, sometimes the restructuring of the economy um, would need, uh, would ask the government to do some soul searching. And again, this um, practice is not easy um, for an individual and more so for a government. So again, when you need to restructure um, a certain program, for example, on the TVET, um, you need to be able to work with many different ministries, many different parties, many different stakeholders. So again, working together um, is, I think, the number one issue when it comes to restructuring. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Juwita. Uh, Jalil. Uh, I say that, um, first of all, we need to, uh, to, to Nell's point, to bucket what is short term, medium term and long term and be very, very clear and communicate that very clearly so that everyone is in line and they know what are the expectations. Secondly, is to uh, be able to measure a lot of these um, um, assistance that's been given out because with that comes this trust deficit that every single time uh, the government announces more people say, oh, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um, so we need to be able to monitor that. how many jobs you create, what kind, is it sustainable, is it long term, is it going to locals? Third is 
let's use existing players and infrastructure. Let's not recreate new things. Right? Let's just be clever and very strategic about what, you know, I think we have a lot of things already, already created, uh, and there's a lot we can do economically without having to pump new money in. It's just using existing uh, players. Thanks so much, Jalil. Very concise points. And finally, over to you now. I'm going to say I agree with all my fellow panelists, all their points answer the question admirably and much. And the only way that I, the only little value add that I'm going to contribute is just the question of politics. So um, we, I think we, we want to see transformation. Uh, we want to see uh, improvement uh, in the economy, medium term and long term. But I think we also have to be um, uh, very realistic uh, as well as um, a little bit creative in terms of how we, uh, how we do that in this kind of political climate. Um, I would urge everybody uh, to watch the show Borgen on Netflix, if you have Netflix at home. <laughs> it, it shows you what needs to be done when you have a, you know, a government that's based on uh, coalitions and uh, different parties and the kind of horse trading and negotiations that needs to happen in the background. So yeah, we can't do brinkmanship politics anymore. We've got to talk to uh, all the different parties, see what they can contribute. And I think, yeah, if this budget is anything to go by, uh, maybe this was the first step towards having that kind of politics and having, yeah, uh, to see what are the new working arrangements required to get transformation done. Because it is going to be tougher than before. It is going to take longer than before because we can't do top down any, uh, yeah, we can't do top down policies or instructions as easily. Great, thank you so much now. Um, and to all our panelists, I, I, I won't try to summarize the discussion because I think we touched on many different issues. But what I will do is plug um, that this afternoon we have a panel starting at 2 p.m. on social protection, um, which I think is you know something we haven't been able to get into as much in this panel. But is you know where really are the are the pinch points and the vulnerabilities on the ground, and how effective are the current measures, and what is the long term future of social protection in Malaysia that's been really put under the spotlight by the pandemic. And then tomorrow we'll be discussing the political situation. So I think as as Parnell's comment there at the end, really what underpins you know the ability for us to get our economy straight is whether we can get our politics straight. Um, so I think that's uh, absolutely kind of part and parcel of the challenge here. So please uh, do join us for those two further sessions. Um, and thank you again for joining us here this morning. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um,